Welcome everyone. This is Midday Mindfulness. You are in the right spot right now. So welcome. This is the Center for Mindfulness, Compassion, and Resilience from Arizona State University. And this is our team. So we've got Tiara Cash, Dr. Nika Gwechi, Hannah Layton, and the birthday girl, Jackie Spear. Happy birthday, Jackie. <laughs> we love life. We love to celebrate. So happy birthday, Jackie. And I'm Dr. Terry Pipe. I'm Arizona State University's Chief Wellbeing Officer, and I'm delighted to welcome you to Midday Mindfulness. So many of you know, but some of you might not know, that uh, we created these daily YouTube sessions in response to the pandemic and the fact that we had to cancel our two-day conference in March. And ironically, the theme of the conference was community. And yet we could not gather face-to-face -face in community without endangering people. And that was important to us to not put people in danger. So we decided to design these daily um, experiences for you with the intent of continuing to build broaden and deepen our community uh, around those concepts, those lived ideas of mindfulness, compassion, and resilience. So welcome to this community. Uh, you belong here completely. This is um, not just for ASU affiliated people, it's for anyone and everyone. And that's really important for us. It's a, a highly cherished value of ours is that we want to present mindfulness in a way that belongs to anyone and everyone, each and all. And so I'll describe mindfulness in a way that's very simple, especially if you're, if you are a mindfulness scholar, you'll think that I'm very uh, simple minded and that's okay, <laughs> as I am. Um, but we sort of streamline it. I don't wanna say we simplify it. We streamline it to be two ideas and that is presence and focus. And, and that's not to, to oversimplify it. It's just to make it something that is less mysterious or less uh, magical sounding. Uh, because each one of you has practiced mindfulness, whether you've called it those words or not. Anytime that you've been really full on focused and present in the moment, that has been mindfulness. And it is a capacity that every human has innately and just as part of being a human. And it's also something that you can strengthen and build, which is uh, why we have practices built into these daily sessions. And we'll, we'll practice some uh, together in just a, a few minutes. So mindfulness meaning focus and presence. And certainly there are lots of layers that we can add on to that, lots of foundations and attitudes that are very valuable and interesting and uh, worthwhile to focus on. Uh, but, but when you think about it for yourself, please know that you have this capacity and that you can practice it anytime and anywhere. And ideally, it's something that when you practice it and your skill builds, then you're able to move out into your life with more awareness, alertness, awakeness, and a full-on appreciation for what's going on. And I don't mean appreciation as in only gratitude. I mean appreciation as in grasping, really grasping the beauty of a sunset, or really grasping the fact that a spider has eight legs that all move in a a certain way to get them from one spot to another. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. And so when we are open to observing our environment, observing our internal environment as well, we can uh, learn to accept and uh, really treasure moment to moment life as, as we live it. And kind of what happens as a side effect of that is this compassion. We start to understand ourselves a little bit more deeply and a little bit more kindly. We can learn to show up within ourselves with a little bit more compassion and, and understanding, giving ourselves the benefit of the doubt, giving ourselves a break now and again. Um, not that we, you know, it's not that we just uh, sit back and let life happen to us. It's more that we're alert and awake for opportunities and ways that we can grow and become more of who we're meant to be and understand what gift you have to give to the world. So mindfulness is not about giving up goals or ambitions or aspirations, not at all. 
It's about learning how to interact with those in a more uh, present and focused way. So a side effect of mindfulness and how we learn to live on the inside is that we develop compassion. And when that becomes more deeply rooted and grounded within us, abundant, it splashes out <laughs> everywhere. And so you might be at the grocery store or the gas station or walking down the street and uh, you just meet life a little bit more generously and compassionately and you have a little bit more empathy and understanding for others. Does our world need that today? Yes, it does. It needed it yesterday too. And my hunch is it'll need it tomorrow as well. So that's okay. That's what we're growing. We're growing those muscles of mindfulness and compassion. And lo and behold, when we practice those things, mindfulness and compassion, we also become more resilient. And by that, I mean able to bounce back and get stronger when we meet adversity or life's challenges. And we do this not only on an individual basis, but as families and communities and societies, and maybe even the planet. That's, that's our hope. And that's uh, where we are heading step by step, moment by moment. So if you've joined us on the live stream, you have the really cool ability to interact with us. So you can chat with us using the chat function. And we really like to hear from you, hear where you are in the world. We have people from all over the world. We'd love to hear how you're doing, maybe just a word or two that describes how you're feeling today. Uh, we do ask you that you keep your comments to these ideas of mindfulness, compassion, and resilience, or to any questions that you have uh, pertaining to those or at the center for mindfulness at ASU. Um, a lot of people uh, that have joined us over the, I <laughs> can't believe it's been months, over the days, weeks, and months, have formed uh, a nice uh, back and forth chat, and that's fine too. Just um, please keep it inclusive and um, really wanting to uplift each other. That's what we're about here. Uh, you can subscribe to this YouTube channel and you'll get updates and you'll get reminders of when they're going live. And if you're not listening to this live, if you've gotten this after the fact in our archives, um, that's great too. We have over, we have almost 80 sessions archived on our website. So you can look for those and free, you know, freely share them. They are of no cost to you and you, we want to broaden and build our community. So share away. All right, team, have I forgotten anything? All right, our theme for the day, Dr. Gwechi is going to lead us through uh, the love languages. What's your love language? How do you display to love, to, you know, display love to other people and how do they receive it? So getting primed for that, I'll lead you in a very short practice so that we can get right to her, um, her lesson for today. So finding yourself in a comfortable and upright position and my team, you can turn off your cameras if you'd like. This is only going to be a minute or two, but you're welcome to uh, do that if you'd like. So you can close your eyes down or just soften your gaze and start to really dwell within yourself. Really start to arrive right here in this moment. You've likely done a lot today or you've had a lot going on in your mind. And now is the opportunity to separate from that. Take a bit of a vacation. It will all be there for you when this hour ends. So now is a chance to just set it down. And drawing your attention inward, just seeing if you can focus on something. This could be your body's posture. It could be where you find your center. It could be the area around your heart or your breath, just choose something to focus on. And just inviting your attention to rest on that focus point. Naturally, you'll find interruptions or distractions, sounds, that's part of the practice. So when you notice, just gently Ease your attention right back to where it belongs. It's like coming home to yourself. Maybe checking in with yourself today. Or 
How does your attention find you? So now just keep in company with yourself for a moment. Being a good friend to yourself. Accepting you for all that is you right now. Things that you might like and the things that you might not like. It all belongs right here. Maybe creating an intention to just hold your presence in this friendly and gentle way for as long as you can. And when you forget to just move it back, move your attention back, move your affection back to yourself. We do this not because you're selfish or I'm selfish. We do this because when we begin to be more compassionate with ourselves, we naturally become more compassionate with others and with the planet. So now just really savoring this sense of having arrived, the sense of belonging right here and right now just for who you are. No need to be any other way or do any other thing. Perhaps uh, again, creating this intention to stay friendly with yourself and open-minded and curious. So now bringing movements into your body as a way to end your practice for now. So maybe moving small, small movements or maybe larger stretches. You can go ahead and reopen your eyes if they've been closed. And come back into your, the awareness of the space that's around you and your presence in it. So thank you so much for practicing with me. Dr. Nika Gwechi, please take it away. Thanks so much, Ari, and thank you for that lovely centering practice. And um, also the introduction that you just shared is a really nice tie-in to what we're going to be talking about today, which is love languages. And Terry mentioned in the beginning that, you know, we are all really in need of compassion, of understanding. And while love languages is a fun topic, it's also a way of building relationships with each other where the communication is deeper and the understanding um, is according to the pers the recipient's language that they can understand it and your language. So today we're going to be talking about interpersonal communication. And of course, there is interpersonal communication, group communication, community environment. But today we're really going to be talking about one on one communication. And this could be between yourself and anybody. It could be a romantic partner. It could be a friend, a family member, a colleague, somebody that you work with, somebody that you volunteer with. And we're going to be talking about how do we receive love for ourselves? How do we best um, take in affection uh, and love? And how do we express our bids for affection? Bids for affection were, is a term that is coined by the Gottman Institute. And these are really opportunities for positive connection. So bids for affection, we do these without even really realizing that we're doing them. Um, but they are bids to connect and to communicate with our loved ones. It could be something as simple as um, you know, putting your hand on somebody's shoulder or trying to start up a conversation. And if those bids of affection are received and um, expressed, then it builds a stronger relationship. But if these bids for connection don't fall on deaf ears, then that can determine the breakdown of a relationship, right? So the more bids for affection that are expressed and received, the stronger the relationship usually is. So I'd like you to take a moment to get a pen and paper or a journal or something to write with. And I'll give you a minute or so to think about this. So for this exercise, 
There are many people that we could talk about love languages for, but for this exercise, think of one person. So again, it could be a romantic partner, but it could also be a friend or family member. So think of one person and think of a time when you felt truly loved. What made you feel loved? What was it? Was it words? Was it actions? Was it um, spending really nice time with somebody? Did they give you a gift? What made you feel truly loved? And then the follow-up question to this is think of that one person and what makes them feel loved and how do you know? What do you do that makes this person feel loved? So wrap up your sentences now and you can, of course, always go back to this um, and express more on paper. But for now, we're going to move on. But keep that pencil and paper because we're going to go through all five of those love languages and we're going to mark uh, one point for each statement that you agree with. So there's going to be five different slides and you're gonna mark down how many you agree with. So for example, the first slide you could agree with two, so just write down two. Uh, this is Puchik and Molly, these are my two dogs and sometimes they love each other and sometimes they express it through uh, spending quality time together. So what is your love language? So think about how you receive love. The first one is words of affirmation. And this really has to do with verbal, written, um, sign language communication, where we express our love with uh, verbally, right? So this is not nonverbal communication. This is not quality time. This is not spending time with somebody. This is really about words. You get an unexpected text with somebody, uh, kind words from your loved one, hearing and saying things like, I love you, you mean a lot to me, um, I appreciate you, those things are important to you. You love compliments and praise, which I do. This is my love language, 100%, verbal, all the way. Um, my loved one takes time to listen to me and tell me they care, so expressing those uh, words. And then poems, letters, or notes, even just little notes, you know, um, saying good morning or I'll see you later. Those can uh, be bids for affection that can be received in a significant way. So for these, how many of these do you agree with? The first one is words of affirmation. This is verbal. All of this is from a book called The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. And it was written in the early 90s, I believe. Uh, and there have been different spins off of these love languages throughout the years, but this is the original work. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more, there is a whole book about this. The next love language is acts of service. Um, this is when people do things for you. Um, and especially if they go out of their way to help you or to do something that you know, that, that they know that you like. So my loved one goes out of their way to do something to help or to show their affection. You might like to do projects together. You might like to do even little things like wash dishes together. That might be considered an act of service for you. Uh, you appreciate when your loved one does something for you that you don't want to do, uh, taking out the garbage, you know, chores that you don't want to do, going to the grocery store. 
This is the love language where actions count for a lot more than words. So words are, you know, great, but actions uh, determine that love. Um, little things like when your partner runs errands for you, it shows that they care or your loved one. Okay, so write down how many of those you agree with for acts of service. The next one is receiving gifts. Little presents, little gifts. It doesn't have to be something big uh, and you know jewelry. It doesn't have to be anything like that. It could be just little tokens of affection that your partner picks up along the way. Even buying you something that you really like at the grocery store, picking up your favorite drink or something like that. That could be uh, a love language for you. So you like presents as symbols of love. You get an unexpected gift from your partner or your loved one. Uh, anything that shows that they've been thinking about you and, um, and showing their affection that way. Thoughtful gifts are a beautiful gesture. Um, th this is a nice one when we're able to travel. When my loved one goes on a trip, I feel special if they bring me home something, some chocolates or something like that, or a souvenir from wherever they are. So this is um, receiving gifts and how many of those, if you can add those up. Quality time, spending time together. Now quality time, it could be in a group setting, but for this one, think more of one-on-one -on -one time. And this is when people spend time together, just the two of them. It could be you know, doing anything, taking walks, even sitting around and reading a book or watching TV, anything that has some kind of quality to it, um, where you feel connected to one another. So you like to just hang out with your loved one, you like to be around them, even if you're not doing a whole lot, um, your loved one focuses only on you, we know how difficult it is to have a bid for affection when another person is on a phone or talking to somebody else or texting, you know, so, uh, so quality time implies that we are not doing that. Eye contact or face to face communication is important in this time of zoom, you know, when we turn our cameras on, it could be uh, a sign of quality time as well. And the last one is physical touch, holding hands. This could be in public or in private. You know, you like uh, doing public displays of affection, like holding hands or um, putting your arms around one another. You know, that's, that's not something that you shy away from. You like to hold hands for no reason. You like to hug for no reason. Um, your bid for affection might be something like uh, giving your partner or your loved one a hug when they get home from work, giving them a kiss when they get home. Um, and you need to feel touch to feel connected. If there's no touch, there's no real connection. Things like getting an unexpected back rub, um, a little massage that is really nice for you. So physical touch. So add those up. Words of affirmation, acts of service, receiving gifts, quality time. So for these, just look at the ones where you have the most um, amount of check marks, and that is your love language. Now, one thing to remember is that we all have one primary love language and a secondary love language. So whichever one is the second highest for you, that's your secondary love language. Um, and we all probably have all of them, but two are the most important for you. Another thing is that we um, tend to give love in the same way that we receive it, but that might not work for your loved one because they might have a completely different love language. And if our partner or loved one doesn't receive love in that way, in the way that we're giving it, it may go unnoticed. And I'll just give an example from my life. So my love language is verbal. Definitely. My husband's love language is acts of service. So for me, I'm waiting to hear things, words of praise, words of affection, and he just doesn't do that. 
But what he does do is he'll, you know, clean up the yard or build me things. And here I am thinking like, well, right. But I mean, I need work. I need praise. Give me some praise. Um, And for him, it's just, you know, this is what I do to show you that I love you. Words don't mean much to him. um, And it's the same way that he receives love. So if I um, do acts of service for him, like picking stuff up at the grocery store that he really likes or taking care of the dogs when he doesn't want to, um, that is how he receives love as well. So now that we know that about one another, we're better able to communicate. And this is really what the five love languages are about. It's about communication, giving and receiving communication, and ultimately building a stronger relationship. Because if one person is doing everything they can in their love language, like these acts of service, and it's not being received, these bids for affection are not being received, then that could signal a breakdown of relationship if they're not received often enough, right? So now that we know this about each other, I go out of my way to not necessarily praise him because he doesn't care about that, um, but to do acts of service for him. And he goes out of his way to write me little notes or to you know um, tell me that I look nice or something like that. And that goes a long way, even though that's not his love language. So now I will ask my team, what is your love language and how do you know? And we can also uh, look at the chat. I'm not on the chat right now, but if there are questions, then my team is checking the chat and we can answer those questions. Or if you have comments that you'd like to share, then you're more than welcome to, but I'll stop the screen share. And I'll, I'll ask you as a point of discussion, what is your love language? <laughs> I guess I will go first. Um, so my love language has been, I think, always and will continue to be acts of service. Um, I checked all five for that slide. Um, and how do I know? It's interesting because it's one of the harder ones, I think, to learn as you get older that that's your love language. Um, But my mom expresses this really, really well. So to give you an example, uh, she came down last weekend to help me pack my entire house. And she was tired, you know, she had a whole week of work and with just such grace and love, she showed up on my doorstep and was like, what can I do to help? And didn't, you know, she didn't have to have any instructions. She just started packing and doing it with joy and love. And we cooked together and we did all these things. Um, and so it really made me feel like she cared about me and she loved me. So, uh, I realized, you know, over the years that, that that's my love language and it's also hers. So it's kind of fun because I also know how to give her that love. But my second one is words of affirmation. And I realized that that's because it's my dad's. So my dad's first love language is words of affirmation. And so I kind of learned in this familial environment, um, how to receive and give love to them. And it kind of became my my love languages as well, so. Yeah, that's so cool that you made the connection between your parents and how your, uh, your love languages are kind of merged with theirs. Um, my, my mother's love language is also acts of service. It's how she receives love. And it took me a really long time to figure that out. But it's how she receives love, especially when you really go out of your way to do something. Like if it's completely uncomfortable and you don't want to do it, then she knows that you love her. So I just make sure to add a little bit of struggle whenever I'm telling her that so that she knows that it is uh, an act of service. I think that my primary love language is quality time. Um, I really just like spending time with the people I love. And, and I kind of know that that's my love language because I get really upset when people are on their phones or on other things. When I'm trying to spend time, I take it very personally, um, even though it's not personal. Um, But I think that that's really important to me. And then words of affirmation and acts of service are tied for a second. Um, I think 
for me, it's really important for words and actions to be in alignment. Um, so when those two come together, it's I very comfortable and very loved when that happens. I always learn so much about my, I think I evolved too. It used to be, my primary one used to be physical touch. Um, and I think that this quarantine has really changed that for me. Um, it's been different types of quality time with people. And um, yeah, I think it's evolving, but thank you, Mika, that this is a great uh, topic. Yeah, that, and that's a, you bring up a really good point. And that's how our love languages can change based on circumstance um, or the people that we're around or not around because now without physical touch, and I'm guessing that physical touch is probably going to be limited um, for a while while this pandemic is still going on. So the people that we maybe hugged before or put our arm around, we might not be able to do that. And so how do we express our affection and our love in that way? So that's a great point. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, that is that is um, hard right now because physical touch is one of my love languages. Actually, the three out of the five, I have scored five <laughs> all of them. So I don't know. I'm not sure how to, uh, how to you know, rank them. But words of information, um, time spent in physical touch, I'd say probably um, time spent in physical touch are probably number one. And then words of affirmation. I like what Hannah said about, you know, words and actions lining up because that really um, resonates with me as well. Um, but and I and I, it's really hard to um, give others the love language that is not you know come that doesn't come naturally to you or that it's not the same that that you receive because that's kind of you know what resonates with you um it's definitely a learning process and it definitely takes effort um and it and it can definitely be frustrating in when when you find that you're not you know your love languages aren't lining up and um but when you figure it out man it really it's, it really makes a difference in, in your relationships when you can figure out their love language and, and deliver that to them. Yeah. And how do you figure that out? I mean, it's, it's by trial and error, I suppose. I make my husband take all of these tests. I've made him take every personality test, every love language test, all of these. It's not easy being married to me, I don't think. But... <laughs> Um, that's why I know all of these things about him, because I think that it strengthens the relationship. Um, so if, if you don't have somebody who is willing to do that, then I think it's just a matter of kind of checking in and, uh, working with what they most respond to. And sometimes it takes a while, Jackie, you're right. Yeah. And I, I do think that it can be really challenging when someone thinks that their love language is this. And they keep telling you that, but it's not getting through. And then you see that it's actually this other thing, but they, you know, they don't see that. So it, it's nice when you can kind of figure that out because <laughs> that can, that can be a challenge. Yeah. Sometimes you see your loved ones more clearly than they see themselves. <laughs> so true. So um, I, I had a tie for words of affirmation and uh, quality time. And I think uh, I've taken this, this test before and pre pandemic, it was really uh, quality time. And so I'm thinking about um, my husband in particular. And, you know, we've been with each other 24 seven for months now. And so the and, and certainly, you know, when you're really focused on someone, it's different than just, you know, living together, just spending time together. So I still really value that. But I think, um, you know, the, the fact that we are together all the time now is, yeah, I'm really grateful for it, but it doesn't have the same kind of um, tie with my love language, I think, that it might have before, because it's just the way that, <laughs> that we are. It's the kind of the situation. Whereas words of affirmation, I really do, um, you know, verbal, or, or written words just really mean a lot to me. So that's, I think that is now outshining the um, quality time piece. So just, so just a note about how this works at work, uh, because uh, 
in a leadership role I had, not with this team, but with a different team. We did this, you know, the love languages at work, thinking, of course, not love as in romantic, but love as in respect and collegial relationships. And it was very funny because all of us, and there were five, uh, quality time was our, our indicator, which you think would be good. However, it meant that we were meeting all the time because we wanted to show each other, you know, love and respect. And so we, we learned to laugh about it, but also to work with, you know, it's like, yes, I would like to spend more time with you, but, you know, we need to do some other things. So just a, a kind of lighthearted note that you can bring this into the work environment too, just to communicate better. We did this at some point too, didn't we? And it is a really nice tool to have with your team because um, especially when giving any type of feedback or having one-on-ones, it really makes a difference if you know that person's love language because then you could say, you know, you could either give them words of praise or you could take something off their plate if acts of service is their love language and you know that um, to make them feel appreciated. Um, so it can be with people, I mean, I love all of you, but it could also be with people that you don't necessarily love, but you feel affection for, and you want to um, promote a comfortable and safe relationship with. So is there anything from the chat, any questions or any comments that people would like to share? And if not, then I'll just open it up to all of you for a uh, discussion on this. <clears throat> and what about you? Oh, great. Um, Anna said, my husband does acts of service, but it's not mine. Um, so, you know, just recognizing the difference in those love languages there. Um, okay. I hear you, Anna. Right? <laughs> K Pilokes, I think that's how you say that name, said evolution is huge, great. Point, Hannah. Yeah, really good point. Jackie Hannah. said it can be challenging when your love language is not the same, and it's definitely a learning process. So I'll throw that there too. Definitely. So one question that I'll throw out to the team and to the chat is where do boundaries come in to all of this? So what part of yourself do you guard most closely? with the people that you surround yourself with. Are you able to share that part in your love language? And do you think that people are able to drop their guard around you? Big questions. <laughs> I guess the, the main point is how does, how do your love languages match up with your boundaries, if at all? I think this is a really great question because one thing that I realized for myself um, is that I really scored a one on both receiving gifts and physical touch. And I think it's because of the boundary aspect. I think in my life, I have um, learned to communicate well with those other love languages. And those other two at the end are reserved for really, really, really intimate relationships. Um, and so I guess for me, that's where the boundary aspect comes in is I can pretty much freely give um, acts of service and I can freely, you know, give words of affirmation. And you all know that I'll tell you, I love you every single day of my life if I could. But when it comes to physical touch and kind of receiving gifts, um, it's, it's definitely a more intimate boundary um, around that. That totally makes sense. And I would love to hear it every day of my life too. So just bring it, bring it on. <laughs> but that makes a lot of sense. You know, those, those um, love languages are reserved for the people that you are most intimate with, right? Um, and some of them are reserved for certain people and not others. So I, I understand that. Yeah, I piggybacking off of that, I really struggle with gifts, with receiving gifts. Um, and I really struggle with um, words of praise. Um, and I think that is because I have a boundary of where I set my worth. 
um, and my worth. I've worked for a long time to make it internal and by my own accord. And so when I receive words of praise, I, I tend to externalize my worth or, or assume that somebody else has to give it to me. Um, and I think I really struggle with, with that. Um, and so, but you all, I, I love words of affirmation from you all. And Nika, you're doing great. This is awesome. You're so wonderful. <laughs> Just thought I'd give you some love. <laughs> great thing to know your supervisor's love language. Definitely. <laughs> but thank you. That's, that's also a really good point, Hannah, um, is to not necessarily have to match up your worth to what other people say or think about you really having that as an internal um, compass for yourself rather than needing it from external sources um, i'm seeing here um kay Pulux is asking how do you avoid making your partner feel rejected when you have different love languages which kind of comes into this boundary thing too, I think, um, really well. I know um, it can be hard when you value different things and that doesn't make either one of them wrong, but for whatever reason with your life experiences, with different things, you just value different things. So sometimes it can be hard to give someone else something that you don't value because you feel like it's not really giving because you don't feel, you don't see it, it as a value. Um, so it's kind of like having to reprogram yourself to think, okay, I don't value this, but they do. And I love them. So I'm going to try to do this for them. And also to turn that back around it is very hard not to feel like if that's how you feel love and you're not getting it in that way, it, it really does feel like rejection. But again, you're, it's having to reprogram how you think and, um, translate it's like you know you're like different languages so you're having to translate their love language into yours and um and of course you would hope that they would try to do you know some of what you need to to feel that love but also you know part of your work is trying to recognize that they are doing things that they you know as much as they can um i know for for my um acts of service um i feel like that's really difficult for me. Like I, try, I, for some reason, I feel like in a lot of ways, like I want to do acts of service for people, but I also feel like I'm um, insinuating or being pushy or putting myself. I, does that make sense? Like I'm trying to think how to, to say it, but like, I feel like I'm put, and in fact, I've had a partner who has, who said they didn't appreciate that kind. So I think it kind of got into my head. Like, like don't don't do this because it's almost more of a something that you're adding to to my day or to um like something i have to deal with that i really don't appreciate um so sometimes you know it can get kind of tricky for that for so for for me for my boundaries it's almost like um like i don't want to cross someone else's boundary by by pushing something onto them you know that they don't want, but I feel like that's something that I need to work on and get over because I, I do like to do things for people. So I, <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like you're talking about encroaching on other people's boundaries um, by having your love language. And I think that the question from the chat is uh, a really good one about rejection. And it it is a different language. That's why they're called love languages. And it's almost like learning a different way of speaking or doing or thinking um, just the same way that you would um, when you're learning a new language or a new skill. And that's what it comes down to. You're ultimately learning new skills and these are communication skills. So I think that if uh, you're feeling rejected or unnoticed, communication is key. And even having a talk about, you know, this is how I see love. This is how I get affection. And I see that we're not really on the same page. So what can we do about it? That That's usually the first step is just having that dialogue and having that communication because the majority of fights and conflicts, they're 
the, the main thing that it stems back on is lack of communication or miscommunication. That's where a lot of our interpersonal suffering comes from. That's just such a, a great point. And I think um, too that, you know, uh, around the question that came from the chat, feeling the rejection, um, it doesn't, just because you don't speak the same love language, it does not mean that you don't love each other which is, I mean, it's basic when you hear me say it, but it's, I think it can be easy to feel that you're not being loved if it's coming at you in a different language <laughs> that you're, you know, you don't understand or you can't receive. But I think that this, these lessons, like the way that you've presented it, you know, this would be a great topic for a conversation around love languages and, and sort of how to, to meet each other in the middle. Um, and, and then just a, a thought around, you know, for, for a lot of people, um, the love languages that they learned as a child growing up, um, you know, didn't match their parents. I mean, Tira gave a beautiful example of, you know, how she learned to be bilingual <laughs> with her mom and dad. It was beautiful. Um, but sometimes people grow up and they have lived in a home where they couldn't give or receive in the same language. And so just to note that it's never too late to give yourself the love in your own love language <laughs> that maybe you didn't get uh, as you were growing up. So like if you're, if you thrive on words of affirmation, write them to yourself and it might feel silly at first, but you know, it, it counts. It really counts or doing an act of service for yourself it counts in a big way. So, so that you can not go around life feeling like you are half full, that you're waiting for other people to fill up your, your love cup, <laughs> so to speak, that you can, you can help by, by paying attention to yourself in the kindest way that you know how. Does that make any sense at all? Thank you, Terry, for bringing that up. I didn't even think about that, but that's such a great point when it comes to self-love that we have our own love languages that we have to express to ourselves and how beautiful it is when it manifests. Like that is self-love. That's what it looks like. Um, wow, great point. Yeah, I, I will just piggyback on that. And I appreciate you saying that because I was thinking about the acts of service and feeling that like, that I'm feeling like I'm encroaching on other people's boundaries. I was thinking, you know, maybe if I would try to do more acts of service for myself and, and make, you know, take some time to do some self-care, then that I think would translate and get me more comfortable with, with doing the acts of service. So I appreciate that, what, what you said, Terry. Yeah, you certainly can't take yourself out of the equation here. Um, and the way that you communicate with yourself is also important in the way that you give and receive love. So I think that uh, some people have, a lot of people, me, many people have difficulty um, with self-love. And so it's, it's difficult to find exactly what language makes you feel good about yourself, makes you feel like you're, that you're taking care of yourself, that you're engaging in self-care and self-love. So excellent point. Is there anything else from the chat? Looks like there's, um, we've got quite a few comments here. Um, Emmanuel says, um, I, I'm not following live, but my first one is words, even if it can be risky because words can be easily misinterpreted or not really true. Mm -hmm. But I find it difficult to have a sec single second because I feel every one of this sees it are equally important. Yeah. yeah. Um, Kay Pilok says, huge on the touch language and gifts. Um, she also says, great job, Nika. Yay, thank you. After my own heart. <laughs> and um, Anna says, it's funny we do things for our partner that we want, but it may not be the right language. Dialogue is definitely key. Yeah. And Kay Pollux also says, great point, Terry. They should teach children that skill in school. And Anna says, love that idea, Terry. 
So I'll have one more question for the team um, and then we can begin to wrap up. So the question is, can we run out of love? And I'll give an example. So my, uh, my best friend, she, her love language is quality time, but we live far away from each other. So the quality time is always on the phone. And she's been like this since we were children. It's always five more minutes, five more minutes, five more minutes. And five more minutes turns into an hour, turns into two hours. And that is how she receives affection from me and from everybody else. Um, is that is that quality time. So I definitely run out of love after that 60 minute mark, probably. Um, and I just can't can't give anymore. So can we run out of love? Well, I think we can run out of time, but I don't know that we run out of love. Do you still love your friend? Yeah. So, um, so my, my really emphatic answer to that is no, we can't run out of love. <laughs> Maybe that's just because that's how I need to believe is that love, like imagination and creativity are is infinite. Um, but that's just how I understand it. And certainly, believe me, I don't have the corner on the market of understanding these big, big ideas. So um, to me, sometimes, though, we can run out of personal resource, like, like time, you know, you just don't have the time or the attention span or the energy to, to give in her love language. Um, but that doesn't mean that you don't love her and hopefully you know it's the fact that she's still your friend she must understand that <laughs> at some level um and, and likewise you know in, in the other languages of like physical touch right now we can't like i can't hug all of you right now but i wish i could and sometimes even just saying that um it helps like it helps express the love that that can't be given in the language that i would like to express it in so I'll stop talking that I'm pretty opinionated about this. I don't think that we can run out of love. Um, I think we can turn it off though. I mean, sometimes when you've been hurt really badly, you have to turn it off uh, for boundary issues. And that's a whole nother session, <laughs> but I'll stop there. <laughs> that's coming next. Um, I, I just was going to say too, like with what Terry was saying at the end, as far as um, it doesn't, it's not a, a, doesn't sound like it's a love issue, but a boundary issue, like, like Terry mentioned, um, it's, it's hitting up against your boundaries. And even if uh, you find that at some point you have to separate yourself from a relationship, that doesn't mean that you don't love them anymore, but you have to take care of yourself sometimes if you need to. And um, and then also, if you're taking care of yourself and you hold your boundaries, then you are able to show back up for the people in your life. Um, and the more you don't take care of yourself and the more you don't hold your boundaries, then the more and more you, you're not able to do that and show them the love that they need. Yeah, and I definitely think that boundaries is an expression of love for yourself, too, because knowing yourself on that much of a level, you can... Um, by creating those boundaries, it's, you know, what's right for you, you know, what's not right for you. Um, and you tell people how to treat you and how you want to be treated. So, good we have a really great comment or a comment I really relate to from Kay Pellox that says maybe the love language is limited, even if the love is limitless. So we have, we can have these boundaries of how we express love, um, but the love is, is always accessible in some way or another, or always underlying some way or another. I'm with Terry. I don't think that it's possible to run out of love. <laughs> At least I hope so. I hope it's not possible. <laughs> I didn't know if, if you all were waiting on me. <laughs> so. <laughs> I don't really have much to add, I, but I totally agree. Um, I think we can run out of time. We can run out of patience. We can run out of space. We can run out of ways of communicating. 
but the love is is always there and I've learned over the years that because my love language I just don't think a lot of people have acts of service as a love language so it's really hard to communicate that one um, because my love language is so odd and the physical touch and the quality time aren't really um, in my top I've had to communicate overly communicate with people um, that this is how much love I can give you from that space right like I love you so much, but I can't spend nine hours on the phone with you. I cannot do it. This is a boundary for me, but please know that I do love you and I do care about you. So also communicating how much I can give you from that love language is important. Yeah, and for the record, I also don't think that, uh, that love is limited and that we can run out of it. Um, it is limitless and in fact, the. I think that the more that we love, the more that we have the potential to love. It's one of those infinity symbol things, I think. Um, the more we, maybe not necessarily the more we give, but the more we hold the capacity to, the more we're able to. Um, and it is definitely a skill to build up these love languages and to communicate in a way that is accessible for yourself and for others. So thank you all for engaging in this conversation and for everybody in the chat. Mika, that was fantastic. It really was. And I think that you probably uh, primed a lot of dinner table conversations <laughs> for tonight <laughs> or phone calls or however people are, are communicating these days. Um, so thank you for giving us the language to really uh, explore this. And then thinking too about how the world is today and, and the fact that we really do need to generate more love in a time when sometimes it feels like the best thing to do is to sort of uh, callous off and uh, cocoon in and, you know, just draw inward. And um, that's not what is needed right now. We do need to reflect and sort of, um, of course, generate love within ourselves, but also having uh, avenues to give love out into the world is really important. And, and it always has been, it always will be. Um, but in these days, sometimes it feels like there's an added uh, challenge to us about how do, we, how do we learn to give this love um, to the world that is um, so, worth, you know, so in need and so worthy of rescue. So a big call to action there, big call to action. So tomorrow, if you can join us, we are going to be talking about athletics and mindfulness. And our own Tiara Cash is going to lead us off and talk about her, her research and her personal experience and her legacy in this area. And then we'll be uh, joined by two guest speakers, Demond McDonald and John Sterling. And uh, Thursday, we have community well-being, which is when we roll up all of the questions that we've gotten over the chat and through our website, and we answer them as best we can as a, a team. And also, of course, engage with our, our chat uh, friends out there in the, the world who also have wisdom to add to the conversation. So we hope that you can join us and we hope that you'll invite your friends, your family and, and people far and wide to join us on this, the YouTube uh, sessions and to visit the archived ones if you haven't. So until we meet again, please, please stay safe and well, stay at home if you can, uh, stay healthy, stay connected. And we really, from our open hearts, our warm hearts, wish you peace on your journey.